powered by Mirabali Insurance, Sunday evenings at 6. Now, from the Signature Bank Studios, this is Chicago's Morning Answer with Dan Proft and Amy Jacobson. Only the biggest stories, only the biggest guests, and only the biggest opinions. This is AM560, The Answer. Top of the morning, Dan and Amy. Uh, the West can't say it hasn't been warned over and over and over again about uh, the cultural revolutionaries in our midst. Uh, James Lindsay, who's a author and commentator on culture, he was part of a uh, panel discussion about these cultural revolutionaries of the left, the new Marxists. Uh, he part of a, a panel discussion before the European Parliament a couple months back. We went over his testimony back then, but let's refresh our recollections in advance of our next guest. James Lindsay describing what uh, we call wokes, wokeism, so many people call wokeism, what it actually is. So here's the definition of equity and see if it sounds like a definition of anything else you've ever heard of. The definition of equity comes from the public administration literature. It was written by a man named George Fredrickson. And the definition is an administered political economy in which shares are adjusted so that citizens are made equal. Does that sound like anything you've heard of before? Like socialism. They're going to administer an economy to make shares equal. The only difference between equity and socialism is the type of property that they redistribute, the type of shares. They're going to redistribute social and cultural capital in addition to economic and material capital. And so this is my thesis when we say what is woke? Woke is Maoism with American characteristics, if I might borrow from Mao himself, who said that his philosophy was Marxism-Leninism with Chinese characteristics, which means woke is Marxism. And it's a very provocative statement. Maoism with American characteristics. Uh, yeah, that is about right. I mean, Maoism, the difference between Maoism and Marxism is basically just the the focus uh, Mao was more focused on the agrarian and Marx on the urban um, social and cultural property but also also uh, actual right if you're in the business of equalizing so on that cultural private property here comes identitarianism wrote a long article for the Harvard Law Review called Whiteness as Property. She explained that whiteness or white privilege constitutes a kind of cultural private property. She says it must be abolished in order to have racial justice. Just like Karl Marx said that in the Communist Manifesto, he wrote, communism can be summarized in a single sentence, the abolition of private property. Well, this is why critical race theory calls to abolish whiteness. Because whiteness is a form of private property. For, I mean, he was talking about Cheryl Harris, by the way, with that Harvard, uh, uh, that, that, that piece by the Harvard scholar. Scholar, I use that term loosely. Uh, for more on this topic, we're pleased to be joined by Xi Van Fleet, Chinese by birth, American by choice, survivor of Mao's Cultural Revolution when she was just a teenager, and a defender of liberty. Her new book, right along the lines of what James Lindsay was saying, Mao's America, a survivor's warning. Shi Van Fleet, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Well, I, uh, I uh, said before the break, um, Shi Van Fleet survived Mao's cultural revolution. How much longer can she survive living in Northern Virginia? Um, what's the answer to that question? Yes, that's why I'm fighting, because I do not want to live under communism again. And so that's exactly my warning is we are in the midst of a revolution and the goal is to overthrow our system to replace it by Marxist and a communist ideology. And also, by the way, uh, Dr. James Lindsay wrote the foreword for my book. Oh, the, perfect. There you go. Well, so, yeah. so, so speak to what you experienced as a teenager in China and what you're seeing in America today, the parallels that you see. Okay, get ready. 
all this okay. that I experienced <laughs> is now familiar to everyone in America. Identity politics, okay? So the entire Chinese population was divided into two groups. The, uh, um, by then, it's not called oppressor, but it's based on the same ideology. The, uh, those who deemed as enemy of the uh, state and those who are the allies of the state. So who were the enemy? The, uh, the government, Mao, decide. Anyone he, doesn't, he did not like, anyone that uh, uh, the people think Mao did not like, all grouped together as the enemy, and they are called the black class. And the rest were uh, the red class. So the whole Cultural Revolution was, the, uh, um, was really the struggle between the black class and, and uh, uh, a red class. And then the black class were the enemies. They were the ones being persecuted by the Red Guards. Millions of them get killed in the process. Other is cancel culture. Everything that's traditional, everything that's old, has to be destroyed, to be uh, replaced by Maoism. The most pure Marxism, that's what we were told. And um, chaos. You've got to have chaos if you want to have a revolution. That's why Mao uh, uh, released all the red cards, 10 million strong, to go to the city um, and destroy everything, toppling down the uh, statues, changing institutional names, uh, looted people's homes in search of anything old, and in the process, kill so many of the people started with their teachers and their principals. And weren't you physically forced to the countryside with other young Chinese for re-education? Yes. And, okay, the the story goes on. Okay, so the the Red Guards did what Mao wanted them to do. But then they they, they really create a monster that they they can no longer control. They start to fight each other and started to really a civil war in China. And uh, so what the Mao did, Mao used military and suppressed them and sent the rest to the countryside to be re-educated by the peasants. And I was, after I graduated from high school, same thing. No jobs. Everything was uh, in ruins. What to do with the young people? Send them all to the countryside. And so I was pretty much the last group that was sent to the countryside. And I worked uh, in the countryside in a primitive condition. Don't think about the countryside in America as all beautiful nature. No, it is like Stone Age primitive. And I worked there for three years before, uh, until Mao died and I was able to go to college. That's my experience of the Cultural Revolution. So, so let, let me just uh, uh, process the progression and get your comment on it. So it's uh, separation, right? Uh, the red and the black. Then... The red attacks the black to create chaos and instill fear. Mm-hmm. Then the despot comes in to reestablish stability. And then people are killed or sent away, and you've achieved full subjugation of your populace. Is that about the process? Pretty much. And in, in, in the process, our civilization was destroyed. Well, yeah. Institutions destroyed. Order destroyed. And, um, yeah, it's basically total chaos. Mao thought that's the problem. Mao thought he could just release the chaos and then he would control it and then uh, build a new order. It's never what you really uh, going to happen as you planned, right? It's out of control. Just like here, the, uh, the, uh, um, the progressives thought now they have an army of uh, the woke, the woke army. But look at now. Look at right now. They create such a monster, it, they, they no longer can control it. You know, the, the, um, the uh, Biden administration condemned Hamas. They had to. Yeah. And then the main media, mainstream media kind of condemned. But not, not those uh, um, protests on the street. They support terrorism. They support killing, raping, and the kidnapping, and, and no one can control them. And that's only the first step. The next step is they are going to commit violence just like the Red Guard. Do you think we're heading to World War III? Uh, uh, looks like so. I don't know. But at least 
and in the uh, uh, inside America, we can see that the Red Guard, American Red Guard, has taken a very, very important step. That they celebrate violence. Then they started to uh, attack Jewish students on campuses. That is absolutely a very, very important step. And uh, where these two, just check out the Cultural Revolution and the story of the Red Guards, which I explained in my book. So the educated classes, the educated classes, the elites in uh, Mao's China, what was their posture as this chaos was being instigated? Was it uh, what we see in America where you have some that uh, are ideologically aligned, so they are proponents essentially, or at least apologists? Was it uh, some who were fearful and so didn't speak up? Was it a combination of the two? What was the dynamic? I think it's a, yeah, I think it's, a, it's both, but um, the Chinese Cultural Revolution is really a huge revolution. Mao mobilized tens of millions of young people to carry out his revolution. And those are the educated ones. They're the, the, the college, the college, high school, or, or as young as middle school. And this weaponization of youth is because they were from the government school. They have been so thoroughly brainwashed, and they will follow mouth water no matter what, even if it means kill your own parents, and many of them did that. And that is the same kind of uh, toxic ideology driven the, uh, the young people that we see on the streets and on campuses. And uh, so they don't have the thought of their own. They just follow the ideology by determining who is the oppressor, who is the oppressed. If the, uh, and and then by the oppressor, it's not a thinking, in, uh, no thinking is involved. And then so no matter what, if this is the oppressor, anything down to them, it's justified. So that uh, dynamic uh, during the Cultural Revolution was similar. It was the oppressors and the oppressed, and we must throw off the chains of the oppressors as so defined by Mao. The party. The yeah, Mao. the party. Yes, and, and, so, and so for those in America today who are skeptical that it could go as far off the rails as something like the Cultural Revolution, what do you say to them? Did you see that same sort of skepticism uh, in China during Mao in the early days where people said, well, you know, I I disagree with him. I don't support that. But I mean, it's not like we're not going to start killing each other. He's not you know, people are or overreacting to Mao, sort of the same dismissive rhetoric you get from many on the left today. Well, not quite, because by then China has been ruled by Mao for 17 years and you have only one choice. If your choice is disagree, you know where you'll end up, in jail or in graves. So everybody just kind of follow along. So during the Cultural Revolution, it's not like you're against the party. It's like the party thinks you're against the party. And it's uh, people think you're against the party. No, right. It, it, you see I, what but, I mean? It's, no, no, I understand. I'm, I'm, but, but I'm talking about in, in the early, so it, well in advance of the, the uh, precipice of the Cultural Revolution. Um, when uh, he was uh, brandishing his uh, little red book around town in the early days when he came to power, was there sort of a, um, you know, was there uh, any concern that uh, these were the, the Cultural Revolution as it proceeded were actually his intentions or were people dismissive about others who suggested this guy is taking us down a very dangerous road? I really have to say, at that time, you don't think. You just follow. And you try to make sure you follow very closely, whatever that order is from the party, from Mao. Because doing otherwise, just to, just to show you have no enthusiasm, you are considered uh, uh, resistant. Uh, that's because I've been uh, um, under the uh, communist rule for 17 years. And right now, we are in the earlier stage of uh, conformity that everyone uh, now feel like a, um, woke. You can't disagree with it. If you disagree with the uh, radical transgender ideology, you are transphobia. And if you disagree with BMM, you are racist. And now if you disagree with uh, the uh, um, 
the pro-Hamas uh, movement, then you are a colonialist, or right. you, you know. So it's you are forced. A lot of people disagree, but they are not to say anything. And so we are progressing in the same direction as the Cultural Revolution. Eventually, everyone would, if we don't stop it, everyone would just obey and conform, and uh, then evil will run and rule the world because you no longer dare to say anything different. What's the situation in Loudoun County? Now, you came to some prominence nationally by speaking up at uh, school board meetings at Loudoun County when so many other parents were as well about what was happening there with the curriculum and the, not to mention violence. Um, uh, and, and I wonder, you know, and, and, and the revolt that happened in Loudoun and Fairfax counties put Glenn Youngkin in the governorship uh, in Virginia. So we know that story. But I wonder if that was just a moment just with that superintendent and that school board on those issues, or there's a newfound recognition about what is afoot, as you're describing it, in a well-heeled, educated place like Loudoun and Fairfax. It was just a moment, or is there real, uh, a real different uh, thinking about what's happening that has taken hold there? Yeah, this is a movement. But it takes a lot of uh, a commitment and uh, and uh, um, uh, really de- uh, for, uh, com- uh, committed and devoted people to keep the movement going, and uh, that's the not easy. It's not easy. The conservatives are just not like the uh, uh, radical uh, liberals because lib- liberals are really right now the uh, they are communists. They never sleep. So as uh, conservatives. We can't sleep either. So we have been working. Right now, we have an election coming, and all the school board members are up for a re-election. We're working so hard to uh, try to get uh, uh, conservative uh, board member in. And so uh, it's early uh, voting stage, the 7th, we're going to have the uh, election day. So we have to really work hard on that. But I have something really good to report to, uh, to you um, on November 1st. There are uh, student walkout in Loudoun High School and in another county ne- next uh, uh, nearby, that's Prince, Win- uh, Prince William County. The students walk out in protest against the uh, uh, transgender policies and they demand separate locker room for males and females. And I just, I feel just so happy to see that kind of progress. That is encouraging. She is Shi Van Flee, Chinese by birth, American by choice, survivor of Mao's Cultural Revolution and Defender of Liberty. Her new book, Pick It Up, Mao's America, A Survivor's Warning. Shi Van Flee, thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And she joined us on our turnkey.pro answer line. Listen to podcasts of Dan and Amy from the AM560 mobile app. Download it today at 560theanswer.com slash mobile. Hi, I'm Ken Mariotti, owner of Woodland Windows and Doors in Roselle. We know you're bombarded by choices when shopping for new windows and doors. So we're inviting you.